Hey everybody, welcome back to Walden Community Church. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor here. And uh, we're coming to the end of our first series of the new year. We decided to call it First Things First. First of the year, January, beginnings. We decided let's do something foundational, right? Some bedrock things. So we've talked about finances. We've talked about marriage and family. Uh, last week we talked about fellowship. And today we're going to talk about worship. And so here we are. January is almost over and perhaps so is your resolution. And you know, as 2022 fades into the past and we step forward into 2023, here's my question. What do you want 2023 to be? I mean, just forget resolutions for a minute. When you look back on the previous year, was that your best year ever? And if it wasn't, how can this year be better? I mean, if 2022 was the best year ever, wouldn't you still want this one to be better too? I would think so. I would hope that you would say yes. So I think we should all step forward and cross over into the very best year, right? In Joshua chapter 6, there's a famous story here of uh, Joshua fighting the battle at Jericho, right? Israel is told to take the city of Jericho, and it was, at first glance, an impossible job. Israel is certainly the smaller army, and God was on their side, and they were able to take the city. The next chapter, Joshua chapter 7, we don't teach this Sunday, uh, this story in Sunday school, because in this story, Israel goes up, up against the city of Ai, and uh, they thought they were going to win. They should have won, but they didn't. Joshua 7 says, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not have all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for there are a few. So about three thousand men went up from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about thirty-six of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shabaram and struck them at the desert. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell on the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all, to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say? When Israel was turned their backs before their enemies, for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? The Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up, consecrate the people, and say, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, There are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes, and the tribe that the Lord takes by lot, shall come near by clans. And the clan that the Lord takes shall come near by households. And the households that the Lord takes shall come near man by man. And he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire. He and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near, tribe by tribe. And the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought near the clans of Judah, and the clan of the Zeharites was taken. And he brought near the clan of the Zeharites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought near his household man by man, 
and Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, God of Israel, and give praise to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, Truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar, and 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them, and took them, and see they are hidden in the earth inside my tent, with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and behold, it was hidden in the tent, with the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel. And they laid them down before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold, and his sons and daughters, and his oxen and donkeys and sheep and his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Wow. So basically what happened was the people of Israel were instructed not to take for themselves from the spoils of war from Jericho. But this fellow Achan did. And he hid those treasures under his tent. And because he disobeyed, 36 soldiers died. And the city finds out what Achan did. So they murder him with rocks. They burn the treasure he stole and they cover everything up with boulders. And you can probably see now why we don't teach this story in Sunday school. I don't know. You tell me, does this, does this seem harsh to you? Why did Achan have to die? Anyone who sees gold and trinkets on the ground probably would take them. I mean, was this really so bad? Well, in Joshua 6, it says, The city, all that is within it, will be devoted to the Lord for destruction. And only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. So this was the command, okay? Everything in Jericho is either devoted to the Lord, or destroyed. So, not only did Achan not obey, but since he took from the spoils of war, he's basically taking from God. He's stealing from God. Verse 24 says, They burned the city with fire and everything in it. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put in the treasury of the house of the Lord. Plus, if you think about it, what Achan took, he buried right? He buries, meaning he knows. He knows that what he did was wrong. He sinned and he tried to hide it. But you can't hide things from God. God wanted what was best for Achan. God wanted what was best for Israel. Achan and the tribe of Israel, they are on their way to the promised land. That's where they're all going. That's where this whole story is going. They're going to the promised land, a land of milk and honey, a man where a land where God's protection and God's promises live. And yet, Achan, taking gold means he's not a team player. He's only looking out for himself. He's not obedient. And ultimately, he doesn't trust God's plan. So Achan is stepping away from what God has planned as best for him. He's stepping away from God's inheritance. He's putting his claim into things, in the created. And that is idolatry. Why do you and I need to be saved? Why do we need salvation? What do we need to be saved from? Romans chapter 1, Paul writes an explanation as to why Uh, God is right to punish humanity for their sin. Paul describes this downward progression for humanity. He says, we are unrighteous, and this includes all of us. We were born this way by our own nature. Romans begins by how there are some who have no excuse. They see all of creation, and they still deny that God exists. And he says that 
sinful humans don't want to see, and they don't want other people to see, that there is evidence of God's divine nature in the very things that he has made. Romans 1 says, Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So, why does humanity need to be saved? Paul tells us, because we have exchanged glory for images. We have exchanged the immortal God for mortal things. That is idolatry. Idolatry is at the heart of every sin that we make. Every day that we live is a struggle between righteous God and secular man-made world. Each day we have to decide if we're going to worship him and allow him to save us, or if we're going to place our trust in some sort of man-made thing to save us. Because Romans says the moment we stop looking to God to save us, the moment we start, stop trusting God, to lead us into that promised land. The moment we look to gold, the moment we look to created things, we become separated. We become disconnected from God. And that is the definition of sin. Separation from God. Separation from the Creator. Think about everything we've been discussing so far in this series. Okay, We talked about money and finances. Can money become a form of idolatry for us? Absolutely. We talked about family. We talked about marriage. We talked about relationships. Can those things end up being first in our life above God? Of course. We talked about fellowship. Relationships with other people. Look at anything. Anything. Anything can be an idol, right? if we put it first. When God stops being the reason that you get up in the morning, when God stops being the reason for living, when you begin to be satisfied and find your blessing or find your purpose in something else besides him, then that thing becomes an idol. We mentioned Joshua, Israel. They're wandering in the desert. But does anyone remember how they got there in the first place? How did they get to the desert? They didn't start there. Did they? No. The story begins in Egypt. Israel is captive in Egypt for 430 years. That means generations of people lived and died knowing nothing but captivity, never being free, never knowing another way to live, born and die in captivity. Was Egypt the environment that God wanted his people to be in? Of course not. The ancient Egyptians worshipped over 1,400 different gods and goddesses in their shrines and temples and homes, and we are going to list them all out for you right now. No, we're not. Uh, But there are, there is a, there is a a family group uh, of nine, nine in their pantheon that that are the highest. Atum is the sun god, he is the creator, Shu, the god of air and sky, Tefnut, the god of water and moisture and rain, Geb, the god of earth, Nut, the god of stars and space, Osiris, the god of agriculture, the afterlife, the dead, resurrection, life, Isis, the god of fertility and motherhood and magic, Nephthys, this is another god of the sky, and and Set, who's the god of deserts, storms, disorder, and violence, day in and day out, for 430 years. You live amongst pagans who worship over a thousand gods. And then Moses comes along and says, let my people go. Actually, he says more than that. He says, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go, that they may worship me. Why did God save the people from Egypt? To what end? What were they being saved from? What was the reason that was given? So that they would be free to worship. His people were not free. They could not worship him. They did not live in a land that allowed them to rely on him, to depend on him. 
the sky, water, earth, space, agriculture, life, fertility, even death. Those are all his domain and no other. And his people were not free physically, but worse, they were not free spiritually. Why does Exodus and that story come so early in the Bible? You know, we've made movies about Moses, made movies about the Exodus. Why do the Jews still celebrate Moses as one of their greatest leaders? Because this story sets the entire ball rolling. Genesis is a prelude. It's an overture. But the story starts in Exodus. Because Exodus is your story. It's my story. It's an ancient story. But it's a today story. You live in bondage right now. Born into it. You live in sin. And you live as a stranger in a strange land surrounded by idols. Human-made goals, human-made rewards, human-made purposes for your life. We look everywhere for answers except to the one who has all the answers. We look everywhere for purpose instead of to the one who made us. We look to worship a thing instead of a king. Idolatry is the greatest enemy of your life. It is the root cause of all your sin, and the only antidote for idolatry is worship. You are made to worship God. You are made and set free for that one single purpose. Moses tells Pharaoh, let my people go, and he does. And the people go straight to Mount Sinai, and God gives them the Ten Commandments. And how soon after they receive the Ten Commandments does God tell them that idolatry is bad? Right away. First things first. Exodus 20, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So, God says that he is jealous when we worship other things. We just read about the death of Achan. Is God a jealous God? Rule number one. And even in that same story of the Ten Commandments, Moses returns with the tablets, and what are the, what are the people doing? They're worshiping a golden calf, worshiping Apis, the Egyptian god of fertility and grains and herds. But it takes a while for all that idolatrous nature to get out of them. So 40 years in the desert, even by the time we get to Joshua and Jericho, they still have not learned to trust God fully. Have we? Have we? It's wrong to pick on Israel, isn't it? Because how many of us could say that we haven't a single idol in our own lives? What is your idolatry? Career. It's your source of identity. It's who you are. It's the first question you ask another person. What do you do for a living? It's where you find meaning. Money. That's where you find security, safety. What about those of you who fuss about your appearance? You obsess about your body more than his body or another person in your life. You look to them to fulfill you. They give you meaning more than God. You know, if Egypt had over a thousand gods, I would think in today's world, we have millions. BuzzFeed compiled tweets from people in other countries that were the most popular, what they said about Americans and the things that we obsess over. Why are Americans so obsessed with salads? Why are Americans so obsessed with candles? Why are Americans obsessed with putting ice in their drinks? Why are Americans so obsessed with gender reveal parties? Why are Americans so obsessed with nice grass? Why are Americans obsessed with spelling Mississippi? 
Why are Americans obsessed with cereal? And why are Americans so obsessed with cereal killers? That's hilarious. <laughs> what does the word obsessed mean? It means to preoccupy or fill the mind of someone continually, intrusively, and to a troubling extent. That list from BuzzFeed, that was humorous. But my point still stands. If we are obsessed about anything other than God, it is an idol. And if we bury anything secret under our tent, something we secretly love, but we don't want anyone to know about it, it's an idol. Is your idol going to look like a little stone figurine? No. It's not going to be that obvious. But God says he is jealous. And he doesn't want to share your love. He doesn't want to share your devotion. That's big, right? I mean, that's, that's big, big. That's like stop and take a breath big. When, when we come here to church, I, I know we think of it like it's an afterthought, you know? <laughs> we just call out the, that morning or the night before. Are we going to church tomorrow? Maybe if we're free on Sunday, if we're not doing something, if there isn't a game on, if we're not tired, if we don't have plans, then we will go to church. But this is the most important thing that we do in life. Because this is where we worship God. Well, I could worship God from home. I know, of course you do. You could. <laughs> but do you? Jesus saved you. See, but instead of saving you from Egypt and taking you to the promised land, Jesus saves you from sin and he prepares an eternal resting place for you in heaven. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, the devil comes to him and says, if you will worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. That's everyone's dream, right? Tears for fears. Everybody wants to rule the world. What does Jesus say? You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. A Christian is someone who has turned away from idolatry and turned towards God. It's when we see God for who he is. We consider who we are. Just knowing that, just knowing that should prompt you to bow before him and worship him. We should humbly worship God in honor and reverence because of his great devotion and his love for us. And if we worship God in this way and we offer God all that we have and all that we are, that's worship. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment in all the law? And what did Jesus say? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Notice, it's the greatest right? And first, first things first. According to Jesus, worship with your entire being. If I were following that, just that one verse, if I were following just that one rule, would I have to ever worry about idolatry? No. If I worship with all my heart, mind, soul, strength, that means on Sunday morning, when I come through those doors, I come hungry. I come hungry. You know, sometimes a church's public worship, you come into a church and it maybe feels cold, feels lifeless, feels like they're just going through the motions. So a committee gets formed and they say, come on, let's, let's revive. Let's revive these dead services. And so churches will just up and change their worship style and they'll get new hymnals or they'll get cool new lights or they'll get cool backdrops or electric guitars or a young preacher with tattoos and a ponytail. And maybe all those changes fix things for a while, but not forever. It's just temporary because all of those fixes, all of those changes, they're just outward changes. The only true way to bring fire back into worship 
is to first bring that fire back into our hearts. Psalm 84 is a guide. It can teach us a couple ways that we can put that fire back into our worship. Psalm 84 says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. That psalmist comes hungry. They have an appetite for God. You read this and you can just feel the hunger that they have for God. Look at those words, longs, faints, cries out. Everyone hungers for something, don't they? They hunger for companionship, they hunger for community, for involvement in something greater than ourselves. Our, uh, we hunger for perspective and knowledge and, and to understand the world around us. But it's when that hunger gets directed towards false things that cannot satisfy, that we separate, that we drift away. You know, as a pastor, you know what I hear the most about church? From everyone, even your own kids. Church is boring. Church is boring. Of course it's boring. <laughs> because we've all ruined our appetite. We have satisfied our hunger with the junk food of the world. We've attempted to satisfy our hunger in excess of food and drink or entertainment or work or studies or sex or drugs or worldly companions or worldly organizations or hobbies or sports. So it's no wonder that our worship is limp. We've been gorging ourselves on the junk food of the world and we don't come hungry. We don't worship God with zeal and passion. So you know what Israel used to do? They recognized that they gorged themselves on idols and wicked living. They would do something about it. They would do something very simple and very dramatic. They would fast. In other words, they would go without. Self-denial. Joel says, yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. How? with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Fasting was a sign that they were serious about turning back to God. Fasting was a way to purge all of that junk food out so they could come hungry. You wanna put that fire back into worship? Try fasting. Fast from all that junk food that you've been gorging on. Cut all those things out that are stealing that hunger for God, and then you'll be able to come prepared. You walk in those doors prepared to worship. Verse 5 says, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer Give ear of God of Jacob. That text says, in their hearts. In their hearts are the highways to Zion. What does that mean? It means they've come prepared to enter into worship. Don't miss that point. I ran across a, a quote this week from author Timothy Keller, and I think it'll help us understand this idea of coming prepared for worship. He writes, public worship is only the manifestation of private worship. The reason our public services are dead is that our private devotional life is dead. The quick fix of injecting more upbeat music into our services may seem to solve the problem, but we have ignored the disease that will destroy us unless we seek God's cure. Our church congregations fail to sing with conviction because the song isn't in their hearts before they come to the service. That should hurt. It hurts me to read it. It hurts me to admit it. He says our public worship is only a manifestation of our private worship. I believe that's true. 
So do you prepare yourself for public worship on Sunday by privately worshiping Monday through Saturday? Can you imagine if my son never practiced soccer during the week and then only went to the game on Saturday? He wouldn't do very good. What if the entire team did that? I guarantee you they'd never win a game and they would lose their passion for the game and then they would quit. Hebrews 10 says, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Come prepared. Come prepared. It's awful hard to stir one another up to love and good works when we haven't even prepared our hearts beforehand. We've got to live it Monday to Saturday. Two weeks ago, we talked about the music that plays in our homes. We said garbage in, garbage out. I have permanently changed the music that plays in my car. Monday to Saturday, I need to sing the songs and put them in my heart. I need to read the word and put it in my heart. I need to pray to God. I need to honor Jesus because I need to stand in awe of him every single day. And then when I come to church, I come excited. I come excited. Verse 9 says, Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. One day is better in God's courts than a thousand elsewhere. Wow. <laughs> I think that's hard for any of us to say, isn't it? One Sunday service, listening to Billy Graham, or being at the biggest, fanciest church in the world is better than a thousand days fishing. Who's ever said that? Who's ever been that excited about church? But look closer. Is the author excited about the hymns they sing? Is the author excited about the pastor's message? Nope, it's not even mentioned. So where does all that excitement come from? Just being with God just being in his presence. If you're looking to get excited by the songs that are going to be sung or the preaching that you're going to hear, then you are going to be dissatisfied more often than not. The preacher will be off some week or the message won't be as uh, inspirational as you would have liked. The songs will be a little flat. The selection will be a little old or too slow or too modern for your taste. And yes, church will be boring. And then you don't get excited and then you don't come back. But if you can find a way for your heart to be excited about worshiping with your brothers and sisters in Christ, and that worship is built on God and who he is, then I guarantee you that you will always be satisfied. The psalmist is excited because they were coming to God hungry and prepared their excitement was an outgrowth of a lifestyle that they were already living Monday through Saturday. And then, once you're here, the time that you spend here whew, will fly by. That hour should go fast. Or you would say, wow, we went 10 minutes over. I, I didn't even notice. Because you lose yourself. You're not looking at the clock. You come here, you should forget yourself. Forget your trouble, forget your worry, forget your struggle. You leave yourself at the door because it's not about my favorite song or what I like to do in church. This is about him. It's always been about him. And he has set you free so that you can worship him. Let's worship him through prayer. Lord, you are... God of all creation. Lord, you are master of the host of the heavenly skies. You are creator of everything seen. You are spirit of all that is felt. 
You are all love, all grace, all forgiveness. And we are the created. We were made by you to worship you, to love you. That is why we exist. Thank you for life and breath. Thank you for health. Thank you for the blessings that you give us, for finances, for family, for marriage, for fellowship, for church, for jobs, for homes. These are all the gold that we hold dear. But Lord, if we have to give any of it back, we would freely because it is all given by you. Help us to hold on to none of it tightly, to recognize that all of it is a gift, to put our devotion in you and not things, to put our love in you and not things, to put our worship into you and not things. May we love and worship you each day, each hour, each moment. Recognize those eternal blessings. You are our fortress. You are our rock. You are our shield. You are our hedge of protection. Lord, you are God, creator, master, Lord, Father. You are Son. You are Savior. You are Shepherd. You are Messiah. You are Spirit. You are Breath. We worship you. We worship you. Amen. Every Sunday, we give you that opportunity to come and worship. You are not meant to have fellowship alone, and you are not meant to worship alone. Our doors are here, and we want to be the church where you live. At 9.30, we have a traditional service. We're going to sing hymns. We have a choir. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. We're going to have communion. We're going to do responsive readings. It's going to be the church that you remember, the church that you grew up with. At 11 o'clock, yes, we have guitars. <laughs> we have contemporary music. We come relaxed. It's more of a relaxed atmosphere, but it's still worship. Please consider coming back to church. The time for being alone and at home and worried and afraid is over. Worship the Lord God. Worship in community. Worship as he designed in a church with a family. We get to worship him. And it's too bad that it's only one day a week. It should be a day that we look forward to, a day that we come prepared for, a day that we're excited about. I hope that it becomes those things for you. My greatest joy will be when I'm able to look at these videos that I make and see that nobody is watching them because everyone's here. Be the church where you live. Go with God.